Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Corey Waldron. I'm the executive director here at Centurion, and I will be your MC for the first part of this evening's program. We are so happy to be here with hundreds of you tonight from across the country and even a few guests who are joining us from abroad. It's wonderful to see our longtime supporters as everyone's logging in and so many new friends who are just starting to learn about Centurion and the incredible work that we do here. We'd love to know where everyone is streaming from. So if you have a moment, take a second and drop your location over in the chat. We have a team member who will be monitoring, monitoring the chats and the questions tonight. So if you have something that you'd like to ask or a comment to leave, please feel free to do so. We did receive a number of uh, questions in advance that have been provided to our panelists, but we'll try and get to as many as we can this evening. Just so you know what to expect tonight, we anticipate that this evening's program will run about an hour and a half. We'll start with the three with the stories of three recently freed men and spend a little time with each one of them. After that, John Grisham will join us to tell you about the unbelievable and intertwined cases of Ben Spencer and Richard Miles. Ben and Richard will talk with our founder, Jim McCluskey, who worked on their cases for years. And then John will join them for a wrap up. We hope you'll stay with us all the way through tonight to hear the unimaginable stories of triumph over unthinkable injustice. Before we get started tonight, I want to acknowledge all of the staff that work here at Centurion for the work that they do every day. We process about 1,100 new requests for help every year, and every single letter that we receive gets a reply. I'd also especially like to thank the individuals who really helped to make tonight possible, specifically Layla Wilson, who helped manage all of our backend tech, Tyler Spikes, who handled the production and editing of all the videos you'll see a bit later, and Alan Maiman and Jim Cousins, who conducted the powerful videos that you'll see a little in a little while. We are a small but very multi-talented team here, and everyone is always willing to chip in whenever we need help on any project. So thank you to everyone who jumped in tonight. To kick off our evening, I'd like to invite our board chair, Rob Mooney, to say a few words. Rob has been leading our board for the past six years now, and we all feel very lucky to have him at the helm. Thanks, Rob, for being here with us tonight. Uh, thank you, Corey, and uh, welcome everyone to uh, this evening with uh, Centurion. You know, I get the easy job of reviewing performance highlights and uh, would just ask everyone to consider as I do that, uh, the incredible amount of time, effort, and energy that goes into achieving these results. And of course, the, uh, the funding that's necessary to enable Centurion to continue to, uh, to do that. Um, I, I have the, uh, there it is, uh, the, the, the highlights of 2021 uh, are what I'm going to go over and um, starting with the number of inquiries that we received. So this year we've received 868 uh, inquiries to date. Uh, in an average year, we get around 1100. So we're tracking pretty, uh, pretty well to that, uh, to that number. But uh, really, that's an extraordinary uh, number of uh, people reaching out who are incarcerated uh, to the organization looking for help. Uh, the subset of the inquiries then goes down into uh, cases in development, and we have 165 of those uh, right now. And I would, I would uh, highlight that those are cases in active development, where we are in uh, communication directly with inmates, we're gathering documents, we're doing the work necessary to get to the litigation stage. Um, and and uh, probably there are another 100 cases uh, uh, as uh, on top of that 165 uh, for which we need more data or just in too preliminary a stage to be considered in development. Those cases in development are managed by our two case development managers and probably less than 20 volunteers. So. It's an extraordinary amount of effort that goes into uh, case development. I want to highlight uh, on the right-hand side, you see we've had three releases this year. We were thrilled in March to uh, have uh, Ben Spencer freed in Dallas after 34 years uh, in prison. 
In May, uh, Larry Walker was freed in Philadelphia after 38 years in prison. And in September, in Louisiana, we freed Kevin DeSalle uh, after 24 years in, um, in prison. There is an enormous amount of uh, work that goes on supporting exonerees uh, after they are uh, freed. And we have three, uh, 36, I'm sorry, exonerees uh, involved in that post-release uh, support. That ranges from everything from medical care to transportation, uh, to helping find jobs or accessing local resources. So uh, quite a bit of work goes on in that area as well. Uh, we then move on to uh, litigation and investigation where we have uh, right now 13 active cases going on. Uh, there are more cases than that, probably uh, I think over 20, uh, but 13 where there are legal motions in process, where there are field investigations, forensic testing, things like that, that uh, really evidence uh, activity in the litigation. So an enormous amount of work going on there as well. And finally, I'd like to welcome uh, two new board members to the organization. First, uh, we were thrilled to have Richard Miles join our board uh, this year. Uh, he is, uh, as many know, one of our most active exonerees and the first exoneree to be on the board of directors. And he brings just a tremendous, uh, obviously, depth of experience and perspective to the board. So we're, we're grateful to have him join. And uh, also, we had uh, Vim Kukier. Uh, join us. Uh, Vim is a long-term resident in Princeton and supporter of the organization, so we're just uh, thrilled to have two, two new board members and uh, a growing board of directors. Um, and on behalf of the board, I would just say, again, thank you to everybody who is here uh, viewing us tonight, and thank you for your support. And uh, uh, Corey, I will turn it back to you uh, for the show to uh, get going. Thanks very much, Rob. Tonight's program is very special. You're going to hear from five men who spent a combined total of 147 years in prison for crimes that they did not commit. 147 years of life lost. Their, their names are Larry Walker, Sean Henning, Ricky Birch, Ben Spencer, and Richard Miles. With the exception of Richard, who has been out for about 12 years now, these men are Centurion's most recently released clients. A few of them have only been out of prison for a few months now. For most of them, tonight will be the first time that they get to tell their story in their own wor words to Centurion's audience. Personally, I consider it a great honor and a privilege to be here to present their testimony to you. As you watch and listen tonight, please know that none of the work that Centurion did to free these men would have been possible without your support. Whether you're a longtime donor or you're just learning about our work now, you play a valuable role in helping us to free innocent men and women from wrongful incarceration. Throughout the program tonight, you'll see a QR code on your screen that you can scan with your smartphone camera at any time if you'd like to text a donation to us this evening. We are truly grateful for every dollar that you donate as it provides hope and help for the wrongfully incarcerated. With that, I'd like to begin our evening of storytelling with Larry Walker and his daughter, Sharina. Larry and Sharina recently sat down for a virtual interview with Alan Maiman, the Centurion investigator who worked on Larry's case for nine years. Larry's story is one of a love that transitions unimaginable circumstances and the unbreakable bond of a family. Take a look. Larry Walker spent 38 years in prison for a Philadelphia murder he did not commit. When he was wrongfully convicted in 1983, Larry was 22 years old. His two children were young. His daughter, Sharina, was two, and his son, Larry Jr., was five. Despite the unimaginable circumstances, Larry's family stood by him. They all worked hard to remain connected while Larry fought for his freedom. 
I was about two and a half uh, when my father uh, was uh, taken away from me. Um, I didn't, you know, really realize as to where he was at until I got a little bit older and, you know, was able to understand um, that we were actually going to a, to a prison. But despite that all, we still had a bond. He still showed, you know, gave me that same, you know, love and affection um, from a father that was in home or in prison. Larry even sent the money that he earned working in the prison, 75 plus dollars, back to his family to help support them while he was incarcerated. It made me uh, feel like I was still a part of the family. It still made me feel that uh, I could, you know, contribute in some way. It wasn't much, but, uh, you know, it, it's what I wanted to do. He sent money home for birthdays, um, for sneakers that I, I wanted, um, and never really sat down and thought of what he had to, to do to just get that, the money that he did send. You know, just now hearing it for the first time from him, you know, I never sat down and thought about it. You know, you take and you use it so fast and not really think about, you know, what was behind it in order for you to to, to have that money. So, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Larry's fight to regain his freedom took nearly four decades. Throughout that time, he held on to his innocence and his love for his family to help him get through the time he was serving. I always believed in my innocence. I, you know, I, I knew I was innocent, so that kept me going when I had bad days, you know, just gave me the strength to, uh, uh, to continue to move on. But also family, you know, my son, my daughter, uh, my grandkids, and uh, my uh, sisters and brothers. Centurion joined Larry's family in their fight for his freedom in 2012. Our founder, Jim McCluskey, legal director, Paul Castellaro, and investigator, Alan Maiman, brought an infusion of hope to Larry and his large, unwavering family of supporters. Having Centurion believe in our story, you know, a lot of people didn't believe it. You know, a lot of people, you know, would say, just give up or, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't worry about it. There's nothing really you can do. Just having you guys made such a, a big difference. You, you brought my dad home. It means the world because now you have the support behind you. And once you have that support behind you, which Centurion gave us, when you came on board and you were there, you know, you... You involved me in it. You didn't make it seem for me that it was just another case. It, to me, it seemed that we were a family, that it wasn't just me fighting this battle by myself or me and my father fighting the battle by ourselves, you know, um, especially like me being on the outside. And uh, financially wise, you know, we're talking about 38 years, you know, one lawyer told me, and I'm talking about maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, told me that it would take over 200000 to even start looking at a case like this because you would have to look into finding evidence that may be lost and so forth. So for me to even take on a lawyer, that's the, for me to even get that lawyer, that's the amount that she would have wanted to take. So even in struggle finding lawyers, having people, um, investigators to try to find um any type of evidence, they all wanted money that we didn't have. We didn't have it. And Citrain asked for zero. zero, nothing. On Friday, May 21st, 2021, the Conviction Integrity Unit agreed to Larry's immediate release, but only on the condition that he plea nolo contendere to a reduced charge of third degree murder. Mr. Walker was left with the choice of immediately walking free and being united with his family or staying in prison for years to come, litigating his post-conviction petition. The now 60-year-old Mr. Walker understandably chose freedom, knowing he was walking out of prison as he walked in, an innocent man. After 38 years, he was finally free.
it was like a dream, Alan, or just like, you know how your first Christmas, you know, your first Christmas, you're just so excited about, you know, the gifts that you're receiving for Alan. Um, you know, it was almost like a dream. I mean, I just, uh, I was just so excited. It was many, many years and days in there. I had dreamed that this would come to pass and that uh, I would be walking out through the prison doors. And Alan, I was I was so nervous. I was excited at the same time. Alan, uh, one of the CEOs came over to me and uh, let me peep out the window, and I seen all the all the people out there and uh, the uh, news uh, the news people, and uh, I saw you, and um, I was just I just couldn't wait, Alan. I just really couldn't wait. I was just really thankful. Larry has been free for six months. He's living in Philadelphia with his daughter and her family, rebuilding his life, doing the things he loves. I'm really excited, Alan, to be home for my uh, first uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, when I was incarcerated, I used to always dream about, you know, being home with the family at Christmas time and uh, Thanksgiving and New Year's. And um, it was part of that kept me, kept me motivated, you know, it gave me hope. And I'm, I'm just excited to sit down with the family and have a nice meal and be my grandchildren. Um, looking forward to the food as well. You know, I, uh, the prison food was, uh, it's like night and day in there. And um, to have a home cooked meal, I'm just really excited to have my daughter cook it for me. And um, I'm just really thankful for this, uh, to be home for this uh, you know, Thanksgiving. We asked Larry and Sharina about their experience working with Censure. I believe that I would have given up a long time ago if I didn't have Centurion believing in me, you know, and um, you know, I'm just truly thankful. You know, I just hope that people understand that, you know, it's it's a it's a list, it's a uh it's y'all have a board there with people's names on it, and that um, you know, that you know, each name that's on that board, you know, y'all take it personal y'all y'all you know y'all concerned about each name that's on that board it wasn't like we were just another case or you know we were just you know something that you guys just were, were doing you care Centurion is an organization that like I said uh would turn every stone um you know that they're very concerned um it it was times that I, I had a letter from Jim and I used to read the letter over and over, you know, when I didn't have good days or I was going through, you know, my ups and downs. And, 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 and the letter was basically saying, you know, to, you know, that we're working, that, you know, we, we, we're doing everything we can. And that letter, uh, you know, it gave me strength, you know, it, it, it encouraged me to continue to, to, you know, to believe. Even him, my father being out now, you guys are still here. Centurion never left. Us. Yes, yeah. Still call us every day. We still talk. Mm -hmm. We text. Mm -hmm. um, you guys haven't left us. We are very lucky to have Sharina and Larry here with us tonight. I think we're going to try and get them on if possible. Give us one moment. There's Sharina. Hi, Sharina. How are you? Hello. Crying. <laughs> Get your dad on. You okay? Yeah, I'm just, this, this is unbelievable. So I know we're waiting to bring your dad on, but I guess I can ask you, you know, you and your dad both mentioned in that video how excited you were to have him home for his first Thanksgiving. Can you tell us what that was like last week? It was amazing. Uh, I was able to, you know, get the food that he liked and able to cook it for him. Hopefully, you know, he told me it was good. So hopefully he just wasn't <laughs> telling me that. Hopefully it was good actually for him. So, um, you know, it just was, it was good. It was good being there with him for the first time. Um, just that experience is, is priceless. It really is. So, you know, I just can't thank you guys enough for everything that you guys have done. As you can see, I'm crying because, you know, you guys changed our lives. And from the donations from everybody, you know, it definitely helps. It, it helps us all. 
And I just, I can't thank you guys just enough for everything that you've done. Jim, Alan, everyone from Centrarian, Kate. I mean, I've met everyone there, even some of the designeries I have met, their family I have met. And this is because of you guys, because of you. We wouldn't be here. So I can't thank you guys enough. Well, we are very proud and honored to serve you and your family. And we are thrilled to have you all back together again. Um, Larry, mm -hmm. you know, I, I wanted to ask you and thank you for being here with us tonight. You mentioned the board that we have here in our office. And for those of you who don't know, uh, we have a board where we have all of the clients that we're currently working on behalf of that stands in the middle of our office as a reminder of kind of why we do what we do every day. So Larry, I'm wondering if you had something to say to all of those names that are still up on that board, what would you say? Uh, I would just like to say that, um, you know, continue to pray, you know, to, uh, Believe that uh, God can um, answer prayer. Uh, believe that um, Centurion Ministry, like I said before, is doing everything within their power to bring every name that's up on that board. Uh, like when I when I was in prison and I used to see my name up on that board, you know, I was always say, "When will my day come?" You know, I wanted that day to come. And I just like to say to the men and the women that uh, they day will come with the help of Centurion and Ministry. And we look forward to the day when you come here, Larry, and take your name off that board. So thank you both so much for being here with us tonight. We were really happy to have you. Um, and we hope to see you in person really, really soon. So yes, thank you for having okay, us. Thank, thank you, you for having us. So yes, thank and you. please donate, please donate, please donate. <laughs> yes, yes, please donate. Yes. <laughs> thank you guys, <laughs> thank you. Yeah. As you all saw, Larry had a very large network of supporters who believed in his innocence and helped him fight for his freedom for decades. Frankly, his circumstances were unique. Most of the men and women that we serve have very few people, if any, who are helping them from the outside. The next story that you'll hear is a bit more like that of many of our other clients. Sean Henning and Ricky Birch were kids. 17 and 18 years old when they were arrested for a brutal murder that they did not commit. While Ricky's mom and Sean's then in-laws encouraged them to be strong, they fought most of their fight for freedom on their own from behind prison walls. Sean and Ricky recently spoke about their battle for justice with Jim Cousins, the centurion and investigator and attorney who worked on their cases for more than five years. Here's Sean and Ricky's stories. In 1987, Sean Henning and Ralph Ricky Birch were wrongfully convicted of a gruesome murder they did not commit. Sean was sentenced to 50 years and Ricky to 55 years. Sean was 17. Ricky was 18. For me, like I visualize right now in the moment, the moment when the foreman for the jury stood up and said that they uh, were finding me guilty. Like I knew that I wasn't able during my criminal trial to defend myself the way I wanted to. And there was um, a doom in that verdict when he read it like it just it it broke me in a lot of ways and yeah there's just not a word for that I had a public defender who didn't do a whole lot of investigation work in my trial and nor did he in the pre-trial it showed during trial and that was um, pretty abysmal but first of all I was confident in a trial that I wasn't going to be convicted and then I was and then through the appeals process, I was confident my attorneys were telling me that we had really good issues and I was confident it would be overturned and that I would get out soon. And then after the appeal was denied, a guy helped me file a habeas and I was confident that surely it's an effective assistance to counsel. That's going to work and that took years. So it actually took several years before I got to the point where I went, oh man, <laughs> yeah, this, this just isn't working. The truth isn't gonna come out. And then 
I went, I wavered back and forth for years between, yeah, I didn't do it. So I know that eventually I'm going to get out and uh, I'm going to have to do this whole thing. For years, Ricky and Sean fought to find someone who would listen to them and help them prove their innocence. In the meantime, they found ways to survive and started fighting for their freedom. And, I, you know, in some weird way, I guess I was lucky in, 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 a, in a weird way because I didn't go through this myself. I had a co-defendant in this also, and we all know Centurion, Ralph Ricky Birch, you know, who, he's my co-defendant. And so I had him constantly reminding me, keep my head up and, and to keep moving forward and we're going to go home. And our story is not going to end like that, you know, like we didn't do it move forward you know i became paralegal and i did the i just i realized i gotta stay out of trouble in order to be able to even have a chance to challenge this conviction in 2015 centurion's jim cousins and attorneys from two partnering law firms craig robb from izzard kendall and robb and andrew roche from the kirschbaum law group took over sean and ricky's case it was kate hill later Kate Tremont I mean um but Kate Hill well, I was writing with her and then she it was through the years it was several interns they would always ask me questions and I would answer that gave me a lot of confidence because there was always somebody there hearing me and listening to me and my feelings were that they believed me and that they they were fighting for me and that was a great help big help. Sean and Ricky's teams worked relentlessly to get their case back into court. They secured witness recantations, uncovered new evidence, and proved that a forensic expert had lied about blood evidence that had been collected at the scene. The case moved up and down the Connecticut court system for many years. Despite numerous heartbreaking disappointments, we never gave up. But I knew, though, that Centurion was telling me across the board, like, we're not done. You know, this isn't over. You know, and um, there are many legs left to go in the legal system, and we're not done swinging. And, you know, just keep your head up. And you guys kept telling me that, you know, keep your head up. And, and so I did. In July of 2018, Sean was released from prison on parole. Ricky remained behind bars. Finally, two years later, on July 10th, 2020, the Connecticut Supreme Court reversed Sean and Ricky's conviction. Ricky was released. After 30 years of wrongful incarceration, they were exonerated. They were truly free. One of the best days in my life, the Supreme Court, you know, unanimously decided that they would overturn our case because they saw um, what had been done the corruption in this case you know, by the state of Connecticut and me walking Ricky out of his courtroom. Like Ricky's story is a story where you know, someone who's on death row or who has life in prison gets exonerated and walks out of prison. That was Ricky's story. I got to walk him out of that courtroom. There are no words as to how powerful, as to how righteous. Like, I don't believe there's a thing called justice. I don't believe in justice. I think that's a bullshit word. I just, I don't think there's anything they could ever do to repay for what they've done to Ricky and I in our lives or anyone else who's been convicted of um, felony murder or murder and, and, you know, being innocent. Like, there's nothing that any of these states or governments or whatever can do to repay us. There just isn't. So for me to be present, to be alive, to witness my co-dependent walk out of courthouse with no handcuffs, no shackles, to be free, to go wherever we wanted on the planet at that point. There are no words, bro. <laughs> there are no words for that. Today, Sean and Ricky are finding ways to move on by rebuilding their lives and doing the things they've missed out on for decades. To now be out here and be able to go to the beach every day, go to music concerts, and, you know, the things that I enjoy doing. You know, I'm now being able to fill my brain with memories and with beautiful things that are starting to 
not erase the bad memories, but you know, they're starting to make me feel um, normal again, if there is such a thing as normal um, in this crazy world. I despise what they did. I gotta let that shit go, and I try all the time to just do that, because if I don't, and I'm angry, and I'm bitter, and I'm caught up in that, I'm not gonna have the rest of my life. And they took that much from me, and I'm not gonna let them have the rest. The peace of being able to see the horizon line and wonder where the horizon line goes, and the sound of the waves and the, the air blowing across the beach, and just to be one with all of that at the same time. I'll take that or standing in front of a rock concert camp any day. And I'm, I'm just, I, you know, I'm happy. I'm able to have like a real life and a relationship and a uh, um, normal city. We asked them what it was like to work with Century. But the one thing that I do want to say is that I love all you guys and I'm so thankful that you all put in the time, you and Craig and Andy and Kate and Karen Goodrow and Mike and Joan O'Rourke and all the people that worked their asses off. Centurion not only worked on my case on the level that they were fighting for my innocence, but they worked wholeheartedly to get votes for parole. That's going above and beyond innocence work. That's civil rights stuff across the board. I would not be home if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for the hard work that you guys did, if it wasn't for Kate, Juman, if it wasn't for Century. I quite frankly don't know if I'd still be alive if it wasn't for you guys. I mean, something years ago that you know, Kate, Juman, and Jim McClaskey started this um, innocent organization, and for them to have all of the successes that they've had, walking men out of courtrooms, reuniting them with their families and with their freedoms, what else needs to be said? Warriors, man. We're just gonna give Sean and Ricky a moment to get on screen with us. We have them here tonight. We feel very lucky to have a minute to speak with them. See Sean is coming on. Hey, Sean, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Good. Good Let's to give you. Ricky a second. Hang on. All right. So thank you both for sharing your stories so honestly. And I know that um, the emotions are still very raw for both of you, I have to imagine. Um, but one of the things that really came across in the conversations that you both had with Jim is how much I think it seemed like your bond while you were incarcerated together was really something that helped you both kind of get through that experience. Um, does that, what does that bond look like today? And how do you, how does it carry you into your futures now that you're free? Well, can I speak first? All right. Yeah. Um, well, the bond was there, especially for the first few years. Um, we were together, same facility, um, encouraging each other. Wasn't just one way that video where Sean says, I kept to he he helped me immensely too. Um, it went both ways, uh, but after like from eighty nine to ninety four, we were in the same facility, and then Connecticut State Police put us on box cars, and made it so we couldn't be in the same facility because we were fighting fighting our conviction, and they didn't want us fighting our conviction. And they didn't want us to be able to get the truth out. So they separated us and they made it so from 94 until the time I got out, 
I seen Sean two times. Wow. And they were both accidental meetings where the DOC just slipped up. He was in the hospital once. I went up there and seen him because I worked hospice. And the other time was where Karen Goodrow, who was representing both of us for the Connecticut Innocence Project, um, called us both down and let us see each other. It's the only time we've seen each other from 94 till 2019. Wow. You know, but yeah, the, the, just knowing that even though we didn't see each other, just knowing that he was there, and knowing that, yeah, you know what? There's a whole bunch of people or there's a few people that believe that we're innocent. Sean, I know he knows I didn't do this shit. And I know he didn't do this shit. That's, that's huge. You know, okay. just having somebody like that. And Sean, what is that? What does that bond look like going into the future for both of you? <clears throat> Um, <laughs> I don't know, like, like watching Looks, the Blue Ridge like, Rock Fest. <laughs> so, so watching this, right, I see like Larry and, and, and his daughter and the emotion in that. And I watched as, you know, they told their story and I felt like what they went through, you know what I mean? Because I lived it myself with, you know, like, you know, like I wanted my family yeah. to have my back and like, I didn't, you know, and my family mm -hmm. like turned their backs on me. And like Ricky was um, really the only family that I, you know, considered having at the time, you know, so um, that's never going to change, man. Like that's never going to change. Love you, man. And we love all, we love both of you guys so much. And we mm -hmm. are, you know, I think what you're both saying is that it's something that we hear frequently and we're really proud of is that the bond between all of you as exonerees is unbreakable and real. And we can't wait to get you all together here in Princeton in the early spring. So um, yeah. know that that's coming. And we're really yeah. grateful that you were able to be here with us tonight. So thank you so much for attending and for being so open with your stories. We're, we're incredibly grateful for that. I love you guys, man. You guys yeah, are warriors. Do. And what I said in the piece, like, I love you guys, man. Like and all of us, love like you, we Jim. stood together. All thank right. you guys. Thank you so thank much, you much guys. Too. We'll talk to you soon. Before we move on, I do want to mention another recently released client who is not here with us tonight. In September of 2020, Kevin DeSalle was released from Angola prison in Louisiana, where he served 24 years for a crime that he did not commit. Since his release, Kevin has been reconnecting with his family and dealing with some health issues that began while he was still incarcerated. While he's not here with us tonight, Kevin is certainly in our thoughts, and we will keep you updated on his progress as he continues to get back on his feet. And now I'm going to turn my MC duties over to our very good friend and Centurion board member, John Grisham. I don't need to tell you that John is an international award-winning best-selling author whose most recent book, The Judges List, has been on the New York Times bestseller list for five weeks now. John is an advocate for the wrongfully incarcerated and for reforming the criminal justice system. We are very, very lucky and grateful to have John on our team and to have him here with us this evening to talk about these next cases. Thank you, John, for being here with us. Thank you, Corey. It's always a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy these uh, get togethers when you get to hear the uh, exonerees tell their stories. They're all moving and touching and always uh, just hard for us uh, to believe. In 2005, I was in Oklahoma trying to research a book, a nonfiction story I was thinking about writing. I don't know why I wanted to write nonfiction. I'd done okay with the novels, but for some reason, I, I read about this story of a young man who was almost executed in Oklahoma for a crime he did not commit. I was in a lawyer's office and I ran across a box labeled Centurion Ministries. I'd never heard of Centurion. I asked some questions and got referrals and made some phone calls and 
soon found myself in Princeton talking to Jim McCloskey. And um, it was a long conversation. Jim likes to talk. We talked about innocence cases. We talked about his work. Uh, I was fascinated by this, this guy who started uh, his own innocence project, I guess. Um, we had a great visit. I was struck by his commitments, dedication, his passion, his all his all consuming uh, commitment to get innocent people out. He started Centurion in 1983 on a hope and a prayer, uh, a shoestring, <laughs> and a conviction that this was his calling in life to free the innocent. He had no training as a police officer or a lawyer or an investigator. Uh, none of this mattered. Jim was determined to, to free the innocent. Since 1983, Jim and his uh, remarkable organization have freed 67 innocent men and women, uh, most of them serving life sentences, some even on death row. Uh, for years, um, I have been trying to convince Jim, I tried to convince Jim, and uh, along with a lot, a lot of other people, to write a book about his remarkable work and his many, many hard fought victories. He always said he was too busy and he was too busy, uh, but he finally did it. Uh, two years ago, he published his memoir. I guess it's a memoir. Uh, it's called When the Truth is All You Have with the story of Jim's career and Centurion, but mainly it's about some of his uh, remarkable cases. It's a very compelling book and I encourage you to read it if you have not done so. So for the next few minutes, Jim's going to spend some time talking with two of his more recent exonerees. Uh, the first is going to be uh, Ben Spencer. Ben got out of prison in Texas this March, uh, this year, after spending 34 years behind bars. In 1987, Ben was living in Dallas. Um, he was 22 years old, newly married, had a child on the way had a good job, had no criminal record. And he um, was convicted by some really uh, shoddy police work. At the time, there was a, um, there was a bizarre, I guess you would call a serial killer loose in Dallas. He, he had the nickname of Batman because he would stalk his victims, almost all young affluent uh, executives who drove nice cars. And he would spot the car and he would stalk the person and wait until the car was parked outside of an office building late at night or on the weekends. He would then attack the driver, club him to death with a bat or something, thus the nickname Batman, and run away in the car, steal the car. This happened at least 10 times around 1987, 1988. It happened in March of that year, and the police decided that. Um, Ben was a suspect. A considerable amount of reward money hit the scene and informants came forward and the police believed the informants. Ben was convicted on the testimony of three extremely shaky, dubious informants and some junk science. Uh, he served 34 years and as I said, uh, got out this year. It took Jim McCloskey and Centurion 20 years to get him out. As we've said all the time, it's fairly easy to convict an innocent person and send them to prison. It's virtually impossible to get them out. Also from Dallas is Richard, uh, Richard Miles. Richard is with Ben tonight. Richard got out a few years ago. Uh, Richard uh, was the victim of terrible police work and just really bad timing. Uh, one night in central Dallas, close to Love Field, where, they, where both of them lived, uh, two men were shot. Two men were sitting in a car at a Texaco station, and both of them were shot. A witness saw it and gave chase and reported back that he had seen where the gunman went. The police were soon on the scene. They were red hot with uh, excitement because they had an eyewitness. It was an active chase. They knew they were about to catch the guy, and Richard Miles walked into the scene. He didn't have a chance. Uh, the police, he was identified. 
the police grabbed him. They, they, they created what they always do. It's called tunnel vision. Once they have a, their suspect, they uh, ignore all other evidence. They seize evidence that bolsters their theory and they pay attention to nothing else. Richard uh, went to prison and spent 14 years. Um, since then, he has uh, dedicated his life to helping uh, men who have just been released from prison. His foundation is called uh, Miles of Freedom. It's a wonderful organization. And he will discuss that with our dear friend, uh, Jim McCloskey and Ben Spencer. Here they are. That's my dog barking, sorry. Here they are. How you doing? Hi. <laughs> There hey we guys. go. It took me a while to figure out how to get on screen here, but I did. Hey, John, thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction, and it, it helped set the stage for uh, our, the conversation between uh, me and, uh, and Richard and Ben. These are two uh, sharp looking guys down there in Dallas. They happen to be at the office of the, one of our former exonerees, Joyce Ann Brown, in, in, in South Dallas. And uh, Joyce was, Joyce, we freed Joyce back in 1989 from a Dallas murder. And she fought tirelessly and worked with us uh, to uh, help free both Richard and Ben. Uh, two different cases, as you heard from John. Um, so it's just kind of touching. Now, Joyce sadly and tragically died <clears throat> three weeks after my retirement party in 2015. Uh, and I was fortunate enough and lucky enough to be able to be one, one of her eulogizers at her memorial service. But anyway, guys, uh, great to see you. You're looking good. Um, it's been a while since we've been face to face, but I guess this is about as close as we're going to get in that regard for a while. I think what I'd, uh, what I'd like to do, if we could, just to start things out, let me, Ben, since you were the first one uh, in prison, in jail, you were, you were arrested in March of 1987, and um, you were eventually convicted and sentenced to life uh, about a year later in early March, March of 1988, when you hit... Um, Soon thereafter, you hit the Dallas, I'm sorry, the Texas prison system. Um, I think it would be interesting to hear from you, and I'll be asking Richard the same kind of question. But Ben, tell us about that day, three days after the victim, Jeffrey Young, was dumped into the neighborhood, uh, not too far from where you lived and from where the witnesses lived, after being assaulted and and, and assaulted and bludgeoned to death at another location, the killers dropped his body, really dumped his body into the, the neighborhood. But um, what was it like, Ben? When, I mean, you're, you're just living your life. You're, as John pointed out, you're 22 years old. You and Deborah, your lovely wife, uh, were married for, for a while recently. And uh, she was pregnant with what turned out to be your, your, your boy, PJ who was born in May of, of, of 87. Tell us about that horrendous week of your arrest and then the time in the Dallas County Jail awaiting trial. You know, what was going through your mind? What, was, what were you experiencing? Well, uh, to be honest, to be honest, to be honest it, was, it was difficult to, to understand how this all came about because I had only heard about uh, them finding this this man, Jeffrey Young, on the street and his car being found uh, less than a block, maybe a half a block away from where I live. And so when the investigator who arrested me, which was an investigator by the name of Jesse Brasino, uh, when he eventually told me what I was under arrest for, I just could not believe it because I actually thought they were here, they were there to arrest, maybe looking for my my stepfather at the time because he had shot someone recently. And so I thought maybe they were looking for him. And it turned out it was I they was looking 
they, they were looking for it. And I was under arrest for a capital murder. And I just couldn't believe it. It was, uh, you know, the life I was living at that time, you know, working, uh, had recently been married two months prior. And, and both Deb and I were expecting our, our first and only child now, but uh, we're expecting our child, you know, to be born. You know, so I was just really pretty much, you know, couldn't believe that uh, I found myself in this situation like that. Now you're you're sitting in now you're sitting in the Dallas County Jail awaiting trial. Um, I'm just curious. I just thought of something this this afternoon. Um, was Deborah able to bring BJ, your your infant son, to the county jail while you were awaiting trial? Did you ever see BJ at that time, your baby? Yeah. Yes, uh, she would bring him occasionally. Uh, sometimes she came by herself, sometimes she brought him along. Yeah, yeah. And so now you're sitting in, in the dock at the trial, and uh, three of these, what turned out to be, and we were able to demonstrate it, uh, lying eyewitnesses came forward and said that you and your co-defendant, Robert Mitchell, who's not with us, he unfortunately died um, about 15 years ago, but anyway, um, you're sitting in the dock and you see these three people, one after another, tell the jury that you were the man they saw exit the, the victim's car that was aband and abandoned in the alleyway uh, in that same neighborhood, just a half a block away from where they dumped the body minutes earlier. Uh, what, and, then, and then you see uh, Danny Edwards, who was a, a career violent criminal, uh, say that you confessed the crime to him and while you're in a county jail. What was going through your mind at that point? Uh, I couldn't, again, I couldn't believe the, the accusation that were being made. I couldn't understand why uh, at that time that they were accusing both me and Robert Mitchell. I mean, I, I hadn't been with Robert Mitchell, I hadn't seen Robert Mitchell that day, uh, hadn't even seen the, the vehicle which belonged to the victim. Uh, the first time I even laid eyes on the vehicle itself was on, on pictures that they presented at trial. So to hear my neighbors come forward and, and claim to have seen me get out, get out of the car, I mean, that was just unbelievable. I couldn't believe it. Uh, for a man, that, yeah, I'm sorry. Did you think they were just making a, a mistake of identification? Or did you, did you think during the trial, these people are lying? Well, I've, I've always thought that they, I know that they didn't make a false identification. I doubt that they even saw anything that night, uh, especially Gladys Oliver. I mean, my, my belief is that she saw an opportunity to, to receive money and she came up with these claims because, I mean, when you listen to her, her testimony, it's just unbelievable that she would get out of bed after the dogs had been barking according to her for some time and the car was just pulling into the alley according to her. So my question has always been, what were the dogs barking at to begin with? And, no. you know, why, if, if this car pulled in the alley and had the dogs barking, why, you know, it's just unbelievable. And then, then uh, it goes to the jury. Were you, did you, were you confident that uh, the jury would quit you or did you know you were heading down to the, you are heading down south to the prison? Well, I always thought I would be found not guilty. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I knew I didn't commit the crime. I knew I wasn't there. And I always believed that the truth would prevail and that I would be set free and return home to my family. So we'll get into uh, your stay in the prison when you and when you and Richard, your compadre sitting right next to you, happened to meet in the same prison and formed that friendship. But Richard, getting, getting back to you, um, you, you experienced the same thing. You're a 19 year old, 19 year old young man. Um, why don't you, if you will, take us take a minute or two and just tell us what happened. Uh, how did you get arrested? What, I mean, what, that must have been shocking to you. Yeah, so I was uh, 19 and just once again, I'm excited and, and glad to see everybody that's zooming in. I was 19 years old, uh, had a girlfriend that stayed in Oak Cliff and was at, I stayed in North Dallas and my friend drove me uh, to, to her house early that morning, May 15th. And I stayed over there all day and the buses stopped running in Dallas around 12, 30 or one o'clock. So I paid my friend Ernest 
five dollars to drive me from Oak Cliff back to North Dallas. And it, to me, it was a normal night, man. I we got to his girlfriend's house first, and so I paid him, gave him the five dollars, and got out and started walking home. Anything about Dallas? I stayed maybe about a uh, five minute walk. Uh, from where Ernest, his girlfriend stayed to where I actually stayed. And in the process of me walking home, I was picked up by the police. You know, I got to a Red Coleman liquor store to call my friend to ask me to unlock the door because I didn't have a key. Crossed the street, seen a police car, didn't pay any attention to it. Next thing I know, a helicopter shined its light on me. Police cars come from everywhere saying, lay on the ground. I get on the ground read me my Miranda rights and put me in the police car and I'm ending up at a Texaco service station. When I got to this Texaco, I'm telling the police, man, my friend just dropped me off. He's right around the corner. The police officer told me, well, when you get downtown, tell the detective everything and it'll be all right. You know, I'm trusting in, the, I'm trusting in our system that we call our criminal justice system. I refer to it as our criminal legal system. It's just a legal process. And so I got downtown and gave the detective phone numbers of everybody who I was with that night. And the detective went out, stayed gone for about six hours. And he came back and he said, Richard, your story checked out. All of the witnesses said they was with you. But we have a witness that say they saw you kill one person and shoot another person and you're gonna be arraigned for murder and attempted at murder. You know, and so this was after my story had been verified all of that. Uh, so 19 years old, I was arraigned $350,000 and I'm now returning this call, calling my mom and my dad to let them know that I'm in loose story for murder and attempted murder. Wow, well, yeah. And uh, your, your dad was pastor of a, of a church down there and, and uh, your mom uh, helped him out. They, they, they really co-pastored in a sense that, that church um, and, um, and here they get a phone call from you probably in the middle of the night saying that you've been arrested for murder in Dallas. I mean, I can't imagine what it was like for them. And we'll, we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but the thing about your, your situation, Richard, uh, you were, you were arrested and charged with this three hours, basically three hours after the, the, the shooting, um, even at, at your trial, the, the detective and arresting police officer when asked under cross, did it occur to you because the, the, there were about five or six eyewitnesses, five of the six said that the description of the shooter, he was a dark skinned African American, well over six foot tall, about six four, six five, and he was wearing shorts. When you were arrested within 20 minutes of the shooting, you were wearing long uh, blue dicky pants. And right. you were five nine uh, with with brown uh, brown skin. I mean, plus as you say, you had a very compelling, strong alibi, and yet the jury still still convicted you. Um, yeah. Did you think you were going to get convicted uh, during the trial because you really had a pretty good defense? You know, very early on, I felt very very good about the the the, the process, but the longer I stayed in the county jail. You meet other guys that's had dealings with the system, and they'll pretty much tell you, man, innocent or guilty, man, if you go in there messing with their folks, you're going to prison. And even though I knew I was innocent, I was scared to go to trial. And you're not supposed to fear this, you're not supposed to fear our system of justice. But I was scared because everybody knew if you go in there innocent. You're going to go to prison. There's no such thing as reasonable doubt when 12 people are listening to a prosecutor and looking at a person sitting beside a lawyer. That's out the window. And so my time in the county jail, for some reason, Jim, I felt that I was going to be found guilty. Really? Wow. Well, what you didn't know was that that lone solo eyewitness who said you were the shooter, because he happened to be standing in line at the Texaco gas station, you probably, I would guess you thought he would, you knew he, well, first of all, you knew he was making a mistake, but we were able to, to prove later on working with, I might add, the district attorney's conviction integrity unit, uh, that, that lone eyewitness uh, uh, recanted his testimony and told the district attorney's people, 
in 2009, 15 years after your, your incarceration, that he lied, but he was intimidated into doing so by the prosecutor. He told the prosecutor before he hit the stand that um, I can't make an ID. I'm, I'm, I'm not able to make an ID. And the prosecutor said to him, you just you just get in there and you identify the man sitting next to the, next to the attorney at the defense floor, the defense table. And that's what he did. Um, yes, so, sir. I mean, I, I just can't imagine both of you when the jury comes in and proclaims your, your guilt, you guys are both at different times heading down to, to the Texas prison system. Now, Ben, you got there first, I guess, somewhere sometime in 1988, seven years later, Richard arrives in 1995. You guys didn't know each other at all. Uh, talk a little bit about how you fellows came to know each other and be really good friends in prison as two innocent men wrongly convicted in Dallas. Either well, one started off. I would just say that at the time I was working in the MA barbershop and, and I had been locked up some time and it's never been any secret for me to talk about my case, you know, so. I would always talk about my case, about my innocence. And I think Richard was in and he heard me talk about my case and I was cutting his hair and, and we, he started telling me about his case. And, and so that's how we kind of uh, gathered a friendship, you know, both talking about our case and discussing. And uh, I kind of, at the time, Joyce Ann Brown, she had started the organization MASS and her initial plan was to also work with actual innocence cases. And in fact, I had uh, corresponded with her. And after a few months, she eventually wrote me back and told me that she was going to be unable to help me in that regard because someone had sued Mass uh, because of the loss of transcripts or so, something like that. And so Richard was telling me about how she was going to help him. She was going to take his case and get him out of prison. I was like, Man, I know she would like to help you, but she's not gonna be able to. And, and he kept, no, she's gonna help me, she's gonna help me. And I kept explaining to him that she wasn't. Then I kind of explained what had happened with her. I said, what she's gonna do is she's gonna pass your information on Century Ministry, which is the same organization that helped her out. And uh, I can remember him coming back to me a, a week or so later telling, man, you was right. Uh, she passed my information on the Century <laughs> Ministry. I said, no, she, yeah. Well, Richard, uh how about you? What's your perspective on beating Ben and you? You two men are languishing in prison for the, as far as you know, for the rest of your lives. Um, right. And uh, how did you? Uh, how did you and Ben uh, really become that that friendship? Develop that friendship so well? Yeah. You know, so it's pretty much as Ben said, and you know, as we talked yesterday, uh, Jim. I think the full circle moment is we're in the office of Miss Joyce Ann Brown now. You know, she passed you know, in 2015, but but a, a woman that was an advocate uh, for not only the innocence movement for criminal justice and for civil rights, she was just a, a star in her own realm. And for Ben and I to be in her presence and she's not present, it says a lot about just the mission in general. Uh, but man, when I, when I met Ben, he was cutting her in a barbershop and Ben didn't have to share the, the, the Witherspoon address of Centurion with me. He could have kept that to himself. I didn't know Ben. Ben didn't know me. I'm fresh on Cofield unit, 5,000 man unit, maximum security unit, you know, but Ben opened up himself and he gave me that. And after that, you know, I wrote him. But, but one thing Ben also did, Ben told me, he said, look, man, your direct appeal is going to get denied. And so he's already prepping me for what I'm going to run into dealing with the Texas criminal legal system, right? He's saying, man, your direct appeal is going to get denied, so you need to be in the law library working on your writ of habeas corpus. I, I'm not even a lawyer. I'm 20 years old. What, what is a writ? Mm -hmm. You know, but Ben pushed me because he knew what I was going to have to experience. And so by him pushing me, you know, that kept me out there. And it encouraged me because it showed me, Jim, that I wasn't the only person going through this here. So much like Sean Henning's um, case where he had somebody to walk with him. When I met Ben and so many other innocent men on Cochlear Union, it changed my perspective about the fight and it showed that it's bigger than just me. Right. 
Well, the thing about it is that the ironic thing is that Ben's the one who, Ben is the one who pointed you to Centurion Ministries. Um, and we were, the stars were aligned for you, Richard, because we began work on your case in 2008, in July of 2008, and you were freed in October 2009. That's 15 months. You and Joyce A. and Brown are tied in, in terms of the how little time it took to, to free both of you, you, you folks. But you walk out in October of 2009, and Ben is still in prison. In fact, it took another 12 years uh, of his imprisonment before we were able to, to free him. Uh, ben, when Richard walked out in October of 2009, what were your feelings at that point, and what was the state of your, of your case? Well, at the time, I was, uh, when Richard was walked out, I was in the county jail uh, awaiting a ruling from the Court of Criminal Appeals. Uh, uh, but I was ecstatic when they released him because I, you know, I always believed that my day would come one day. I didn't know when. And I didn't even resolve myself to the fact that, you know, regardless to what occurs in my life, I'm going to keep my faith and trust in God. So that was what my hope lied in, was in God and things lining up at some point in time in my situation. Well, the ironic thing about you, Ben, yeah, you were in the county jail because a year earlier, yeah. we had to, our investigation, we developed some, uh, some new evidence that proved to the satisfaction of the Dallas County judge that those three eyewitnesses lied right. because of the, it was a, uh, because of the distance that they were from that abandoned victim's car in the alleyway and how dark the night was. Um, and the judge found them to be incredible eyewitnesses, plus Danny Edwards recanted at the evidentiary hearing. Right. Um, but here you are uh, awaiting in, in Texas, as m most of the viewers don't know, the county judge doesn't have the authority to vacate a conviction. Right. He makes his recommendations of law and facts and passes on up to the, to the higher court, the Court of Criminal Appeals in Texas. And so uh, Richard walks out and, you know, Ben, I was, I mean, we were all confident that Judge Magnus found as a fact that you were quote unquote, actually innocent. Right. So we thought we had a, we thought we had a, you know, this is a slam dunk. And as it turned out, you know, two years later in 2011, the higher court says that we didn't, uh, we didn't meet the Herculean standard for establishing actual innocence and right. back you go for to spend the rest of your you were never freed you're in a county jail waiting right. because we all thought as you did that uh, the your, the cca the court of criminal appeals would uh, vacate your conviction but they didn't and i just can't imagine how i mean what were you thinking then what were you feeling when we, we lost even though you were declared to be an actually innocent man by the lower lower judge well, I still uh, remain hopeful uh, because I knew that the, that finally someone had heard the truth and I, was, and I just sensed that at some point in time that the truth would prevail, you know. Uh, I can remember returning to, to Cofield and a lot of the guards would look at me and say, man, why are you here? Why are you still here? Why, why haven't they let you go? You know, so that, that in itself gave me hope as well because even the guards around the unit began to to question uh, the legitimacy of my incarceration. Well, yeah, your case is getting a lot of attention, good attention by the by the Dallas Morning News. But let, let me let me plumb the depths a little bit in terms of um, both of you are, are are in prison. Talk about you must have had anger and bitterness in your heart. Uh, but if you didn't, I'd be interested. We'd be interested in hearing about that. And if you did, what were the different stages of uh, psychological and emotional uh, feelings that you had? Well, I can say this for myself. I can only speak for me, but uh, I thank God that I've never felt the bitterness, the anger. Uh, I mean, I was disappointed in the system, but I never, I, I've never reserved any anger or bitterness toward either my accusers or anyone else. Really? Wow, man. How about you, Richard? What were your feelings initially? Did they change at all? Yeah, 
they did. You know, I uh, very early on, I, I'm upset with my, I'm angry with my attorney, angry with the prosecutor. I was mad because my mom damn didn't give up the house, you know, because, mm -hmm. you know, we, we had a court appointed attorney and he asked for money. Um, I was frustrated with the jurors because they listened to all of these facts. And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, when I got to prison, and that's a totally different world, you know, you got to, you got to be a chameleon. Your mind got to click at, at the drop of a dime because you're going from freedom to prison. That we speak that, but that's a transition. And so, I mean, I suffered suicidal thoughts, you know. Uh -huh. You don't want to, you, you feel devalued, you already feel dehumanized when you're guilty in prison. When you're innocent in prison, you devalue. And so you, I, I felt like I had no worth to my family. Here they are sending me money and, and, and I'm innocent and I, I'm, I'm in a system where I'm presumed guilty. You know, uh, I'm thankful that, I'm thankful that I met other innocent men in prison. On Cofield Unit, I met Ricky Wyatt, Christopher Scott, Johnny Pinchback, uh -huh. Andre Garage, Victor Thomas. It was over 20 guys on Cofield Unit. All of us was innocent. And so it showed me it was no time to be angry. We got to fight. And so we all band together, you know what I'm saying? And one by one, we started cracking that wall of the prison system in Texas. And that gave us hope after Larry Bird which was the first James, was it Larry Bird or James Bird? Which one was the first one? Larry Bird? Bird. Bird. Yeah, Larry. Well, Larry was the first person innocent off of Cofield out of and out of Houston. When he cracked that door, it gave everybody else hope. And that's all we needed. We needed one person to crack that door. And that right. changed, you know, the dis despair and, and the disappointment because we had something to look forward to. Well, let's let's talk a little bit, if we can, about uh, your fa your families because they were victims too, uh, and um, I know that um, Richard, your 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 mom Thelma, uh, when she was up at, in Princeton visiting us for one of our affairs, she she told me that you know there were pastors of, of the church down there that you all belonged to that that they ran, and some of the members because their son was convicted of murder some of the members of that church abandoned the church yeah. because how could a how could a pastor raise a son who was a murderer right. so you know talk about the, the effect that your incarceration and imprisonment had on your family during yeah. those 15 years yeah you know I, I think the biggest impact is you know my dad passed six months before i got out right right and uh, it was cancer, um, but you know who's to say that it wasn't extra stress that was added on? Because if you read the legal case, Ex Forte Richard Miles, it showed the due diligence that my dad and my mom showed in fighting and trying to prove my innocence. You know, and so my dad, being uh, a, a fourth forerunner in passing, was very hurtful. And to know that our church, immediate families, you know, when you get convicted. Don't nobody really say that you're innocent. And so my immediate family turned against us. You know, aunts and cousins never wrote me because they thought I was guilty, right. you know? Uh, and, and so we had a, a whole host of people that turned away from us, not because of anything that I did, but because of the, the, the lack of proper um, judicial handling from the people that we put in authority. Yeah, yeah. And now, now ben, I'm sorry, Ben, uh, could you speak about what your imprisonment, you were in prison for 34 years. That's a hell of a long time. And um, how how was your, uh, your you know, of course you, you were married, Deborah, BJ's growing up into a 34 year old man by the by the time you got out. What did your imprisonment do? You had your mom, Lucille, who was who was fighting for you as well. I mean, how did that affect the, the, your family and the relationships? Well, in, in some ways, it destroyed it. Uh, I mean, because I was no longer the son that I should be. Uh, you know, I was uh, gone. I was no longer the husband that I 
should be, nor was I the father that I should have been. I mean, incarceration just takes, takes all that away from us. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't able to be a husband. So eventually, uh, after being incarcerated for several years and kind of feeling like nothing's going to happen, you know, I just encouraged Deborah to go on with her life. We eventually divorced, and, and uh, I guess I assume she tried to move on with her life. And of course, she would bring my son to down to see me. We stayed in contact with each other. We would correspond with each other. You know, she would come visit at times, uh, send me money when she could. So, you know, she was always there. But just being incarcerated really takes away from, from everything that we, that we want to be who we want to be. And, uh, you know, so it just really affects, I, I can't even really speak on the magnitude of how it affects the family and what it takes away from us. Well, in the interest, in the interest of time, um, I, I want to get to your, uh, to going from the bowels of hell prison out into the, the blue skies and sunlight of freedom and uh, Richard, why don't you speak first? Because you were the first one free, and you've been out for a number of years, uh, almost, I guess it's almost 11, well, 11 years now or so. Uh, yeah. But you, you got exonerated and, and the, uh, by, the, by the Court of Criminal Appeals, and you were given uh, compensation for your wrongful imprisonment. And as John mentioned, you started Miles of Freedom, but a lot of other good things have happened in your life, which, uh, which I know the the, the listeners would want to hear about, but also, um, you know, I'm sure freedom after 15 years, that, that, that presented a whole other set of challenges for you, the adjustment you had to make. Could you speak about that a little bit? Yeah, it, it does. You know, coming out of prison, we just talked um, earlier today, uh, Jim, I believe, and I'm coming from a, a foot doctor's appointment because for 15 <laughs> years in prison, they give you these black, no art shoes, they're plastic, and, and, and the prison system just deteriorates your body. I mean, I worked every day, 15, 20 hours a day for free in Texas prison. They don't pay you nothing, you know? And then to get out and try to maintain some type of semblance of order when your body has just been beat down from the, from the labor intensive work is one thing. Coming out, being socially, socially engaged with women, because you can't do that in prison. You better not tell an officer she look good. They're gonna put you in, in the holdover. So really being <laughs> able to articulate, you know, emotions and, and talk and, and, and be free. You know, all of that was a challenge for me coming out of prison. You know, I'm thankful that I'm married. I met a woman and she was hooked with, is that a new Cadillac? That was the best line that I could have. That's how. That's how I got my wife. I seen this. We that was at a car. That was at a car wash. <laughs> yes, it was at a car wash. You know, and so I, I, I say that I was handicapped, and it took me a minute to understand that the system handicapped me. And so my transition has been that of a person that's walking with the handicap, but acknowledging these are the areas that I'm weak in. These are the places that I need strength in. And so miles of freedom came after my exoneration. Also with Miles of Freedom this year, the Richard Miles Act, which is a law that was passed yeah. September 1st, 2021, that deals with the accountability of police officers turning over all the evidence before, jury, before trial, making sure that the VA adds all of the evidence. It shouldn't be a law because it should be integrity, but now it's put it on paper and so it's a law, you know? And so that was passed. And so. We've, we've been able to accomplish a lot. Exporte Richard Miles. It's a, a case cited in the law books. If a person is innocent in prison, you can use Exporte Richard Miles as that foundating case to open up the courts to get back in. You know, well, they, 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 they call that act the Richard Miles Act. Yes, sir. For the very reason that you pointed out that in your case, uh, two months before your trial, you're indicted, you're awaiting trial, the homicide uh, officer got a telephone call from a woman telling him, you guys got the wrong man for that shooting at the Texaco gas station, my former boyfriend, and she named him K-9. 
Keith yeah. Richards, uh, told me that he did that shooting and he used a nine millimeter gun and they got an innocent man in jail for that crime. And only the police and the shooter knew the caliber of the, of the, uh, of the, of the weapon. And so that was, what did the Dallas police do with that? They buried it. Yeah. I don't think they even gave it to the prosecutor's office because they had their man, you. So yeah. they did not bother to investigate that very important lead. And by the way, I visited with Mr. Richard down at West Palm Beach uh, <clears throat> as part of the investigation, and he fit the description of the shooter perfectly. He was dark skinned, 6'6", six, six, and, uh, uh, and slim. Uh, but anyway, uh, the, the, uh, the state legislature passed that, that law uh, requiring all law enforcement agencies to turn over any exculpatory or information that would serve the benefit of you to the defendants and also to the prosecutor's office. Yes. Um, so, um, Ben, um, tell us a little bit about your life. Now, you're, you're what, uh, March? You're what, about eight, nine months in the, into the land of the free? Right. Tell us a little bit about your life and what it's like, what challenges you have. You had a, you are still facing, I'm sure. Well, uh, the child, the biggest challenge I had was trying to deal with a, a cell phone. Uh, <laughs> fortunately, fortunately for me, you know, I, I came out to a support system, you know, uh, Deborah and I, we've, uh, you know, we, we've, I mean, I can't say we reconnected, but we connected and, and uh, planning to get married in January, January 10th, uh, which is our original wedding day back in 87. Uh, you know, I've been, uh, I mean, I've been blessed, you know, God has been good. And, you know, uh, to me, walking out of the county jail was like a breath of fresh air. It's like those 34 years disappeared. I know that they were there, but it seems like I woke up out of a coma or something, you know, so. Uh, I mean, God has been good. I've been, I feel very blessed and very fortunate. You know, I thank God for uh, the avenues that have opened up in my life, you know, the support system that I have. I mean, uh, uh, especially I, I thank God for Century Ministry, you know, the hard labor and work in my case, in Richard's case, and those who have been exonerated and set free before us. I mean, that's y'all's job and y'all work is, is tremendous. It's, it's great. I have one more. Thank you. Thank you, Ben and Richard. One more question before I turn it over to John for his wrap up uh, remarks. And that is this uh, for each of you to speak uh, as, as best you can on it. Ben, you're down for 34 years for something you didn't do. Richard, you're down for 15. How did you endure the unendurable? Did you... Did the candle of hope flicker, maybe go out at times? Did you lose hope, regain it? How did, what sustained you for those many, many years of false imprisonment? Richard, why don't you start? Yeah, you know, um, uh, for me, it's, it's, it was faith, family, and, and, and truth. Faith, family, and truth. You know, uh, I've said this many a times, and I'll say it again. The Bible says there's a peace that surpasses all understanding. When you are innocent, you are at peace. And it covers you and it prevents the pressure or the oppression from impacting you as much as it could. And so during my oppression, I embraced my peace, my innocence. And that's what covered me during, during that time of incarceration. Yeah, you, you knew the truth and, and you knew the truth was not going to change. And yes. eventually the truth was going to set you free. How about you, Ben? What, what sustained you for those three and a half decades? I can attest to the same thing as Richard. I mean, my faith kept me going. Uh, and the fact that, you know, the truth never changes. In regards to what people may believe, the truth remains the same. Facts never change. Uh, so regardless to what people thought or what people had believed about me, I knew that I was innocent and that was all that mattered in my situation. Uh, of course, there were times that I, that 
And I began to wonder if I would ever get out of prison. Uh, but at the same time, even wondering whether I would ever get out of prison, I remained constant in my faith and trust in God because I believe it was him who would sustain me through it up. Did you ever, either of you guys, didn't you ever have doubts that God exists, that God is real? Where is God? <laughs> you never had those doubts? I still have them to this day, and I'm free. No, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say I had those doubts. I mean, I believe that, I believe that things happen in the world that, that we have no control over. And the interesting thing to me about, you know, we talk about God being in control. God is in control, yet I believe he's not in control of our lives. He allows us to make choices in life. In other words, what I'm saying is, though God is in control, he's not going to control us or make us do anything that we don't want to do. Uh, for years, I prayed for my accusers to come forward and tell the truth. However, to this day, only two of them have come forward and, and admitted that they lied. Uh, but I always believe that God is constant. I believe that I believe that God placed in our heart through his Holy Spirit, you know, the things that we should do. Now, whether we yield to those things or not is ultimately our choice in the end. You know, so that's well, just well, you're 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 a man of faith, Ben, and I know Richard is as well. And uh, you you guys inspire me because uh, my faith has gone up and down over the years, and I, I didn't spend one day in jail for something I didn't do. Or even for something I did do, but listen, it was—it's really been interesting and informative to to speak with you and hear you tell your story from the beginning to to the end. So, John, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn it over to you for your uh, your closing uh, thoughts. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yep. I'm yes. here. Thank you. Um, one of our one of our viewers in the chat room wrote in a few moments ago and said, "These are indeed amazing men, and your stories amaze us and inspire us, and still leave us with a level of absolute disbelief." Thank you, Larry Walker, Sean Henning, Ricky Birch. Ben and Richard for your stories. These stories are all the same and they're all so very, very different. They're all about many things, the survival of the human spirit, but they're also about injustice. Wrongful convictions don't just happen by accident. They're caused by people who are often behaving badly or illegally. They're caused by police who suppress evidence or manufacture evidence or solicit testimony from lying witnesses. Uh, most of them are caused by prosecutors who do bad things, who hide evidence, solicit lying witnesses, solicit testimony from bogus experts, they're caused by experts who stretch the realms of science. They're caused by, they're caused by false confessions, by police who, if not physically, certainly emotionally beat confessions out of men who are very vulnerable after long abusive periods of interrogation. Uh, they're caused by bad defense lawyers. They're caused 30% of the time by lying jailhouse snitches. Most civilized nations bar the testimony of jailhouse snitches. These are, these are causes of wrongful convictions that could all be eliminated if we simply had the will to do so. Every wrongful conviction is a fantastic story from a storytelling point of view. As a writer, I'm always looking for what's a great story. Give me a story I can take, change a few facts, and make it very, very compelling. And every wrongful conviction story is a great story because of the amount of human suffering. 
everywhere you have human suffering, you have great fiction. You have great stories. I would love to write everybody's wrongful conviction story, but I can't do that. I'm trying to get Jim McCluskey to do it, but he's still too busy. Um, I'm going to wrap up with a pitch for money, a uh, hardball, bare knuckle request for cash. Uh, there's, a direct, there's a direct correlation between the amount of money we have at Centurion and the number of innocent people we can get out of prison. All of our money comes from private donors. There's no, there's no governmental program to fight wrongful convictions because the government caused the problem. The government says they don't exist. Wrongful convictions don't exist. We know better. We know there are thousands of innocent people in prison. So I appeal to you who are listening. If you got a few bucks, if you got a lot of bucks, whatever, send a check to Centurion Ministries to help these stories get told. Thank you. Thanks a lot, John. I appreciate that. Um, it's always great to have you participate with us in, in these presentations. So you're, you're, a, you're a great human being. Thank you. Corey? Thank you, Jim. Always a, always a pleasure. I'm coming. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Took me a minute to get my camera back on. Thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. I'm very grateful for um, everyone who attended. Thank you so much to our participants, to... Uh, to Jim and John, and most especially to Ben and uh, and Richard and Larry and Sean and Ricky. Um, we are so grateful for your stories. And as um, as John said, you know, we rely on the people uh, who are joining us tonight to help us free more individuals like these incredible men that you heard from tonight. So, Look for our newsletter in the coming days that contains more information about some of the of the of the uh, stories that you heard tonight. And otherwise, have a great evening and a very happy, healthy holiday season. We'll see you all soon.